Welcome to Inspire Campfire, a podcast where ordinary people tell their stories of extraordinary adventure. These are campfire stories meant to inspire the rest of us to light the fire within, get outside, follow our dreams, and return to tell our own stories. Ready? Let's strike the match. Welcome to the show. I am your host, Scott Wurzbacher. April is Earth Month, and we are releasing this episode just ahead of Earth Day, which is April 22nd this year. Adventure often happens outdoors, so I thought it would be important to both celebrate the Earth and dedicate an episode to how we can all participate in protecting and preserving our planet. Our guest today is Karen Ald from Lebanon, New Jersey. Karen is an environmentalist, author, speaker, and mindset coach, and she is seriously passionate about protecting the environment. Her unique approach cuts through politics and unites rather than divides. Karen has a degree in environmental science from Rutgers University and has held various positions in environmental consulting, safety, and sustainability, including her current role at Johnson & Johnson. She also happens to be one of the most creatively fun human beings that I know. Karen and I immediately connected through our mutual love of Star Wars culture during a mastermind group hosted by Robert Holden, who you might remember from episode 54. Together, Robert and Karen recently gave an exclusive talk at Oregon State University about happiness and environmental activism. And she's here with us to share her plan for how we can save the planet. It's a big mission, and I know Karen's up for it. Karen, welcome to the campfire. Oh, thank you, Scott. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, man, we're going to have a fun conversation today. We always do. And so I think we should probably just start with Earth Day itself. Because everybody's heard of Earth Day and and we all want to we all want to celebrate our planet. But can you tell us a little bit about what Earth Day is and how it got started? Sure. So um, Earth Day started in 1970. Uh, It was basically a group of hippies (laughs) that were like, hey, you know, like we, we talk about celebrating the Earth. We talk about that we need to save the planet. And that's really what the, you know, the flower power movement was all about. So they said, you know, we need to do something. We need to have a celebration. And that's really what it all started as was, you know, as just an opportunity to be outside and to celebrate the earth. I love it. I love it. So what's the evolution of Earth Day been since that time? You know, I hate to say it, but it's become a little political. I mean, just the environmental movement in itself is just a very political, you know, it's a political football. That's really what it is. And it's a shame. Um, But there are still groups out there that, you know, the, the importance of Earth Day is to do that celebrating. And, you know, I, that's one of my missions is to remind people that let's get our head out of the political divide and, you know, let's talk about what we love about the earth. Yeah. And this is what I, why I love talking with you about, I know you're passionate about it, but it's really, truly just about the environment. I mean, it's really just about the earth for you. And, uh, and I appreciate that so much. I always enjoy talking with you about it. Karen, um, we're going to get into some of that stuff that you started to allude to, but, but before we do, where, where did your love for the environment come from? It came from the womb. I mean, really, (laughs) you know, I just remember being very little and like having a favorite tree. I loved watching the ants. Like anytime the ants made a, a an ant hill, and it was like you know, you ever watch the ants, and they it's a tiny, tiny little ball of of soil. You know, I just thought that was fascinating, and I would watch them, and I'd say like, where are these ants going? <laughs> you know, and other kids were you know playing with Barbies or whatever, but I wanted to be outside. I knew every critter that was in our yard. I, you know, I knew all of the neighborhood dogs, like I grew up in the seventies. And like, at that point, a lot of people were still, their dogs were outside dogs. Like people, they they had pens. Yeah. And I had one family that I was always checking on their dog 
that they finally started paying me <laughs> because I was, you know, making sure the dog had water, making sure, you know, the pen was clean, you know, things like that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's just really from, from the time I can remember, I've just always, always loved things in the natural world. I mean, it sounds like backyard adventure to me. Oh, totally. Yeah. Always, always. So how for you did that love of just being outside and animals and nature, how did that turn into um, the drive towards environmental science and protecting the environment? When I, when it came to like picking a major, going to college, okay, what do I want for a career? I really wanted to be a photographer. I wanted to be, um, you know, work for National National Geographic, you know, like I just thought, okay, that's, that's what I want to do. And my parents and my guidance counselor were like, you're never going to make any money doing that. <laughs> so um, I, you know, I said, okay, so now what? So my other hero in the you know natural world was Jacques Cousteau. Nice. Uh, so I said, oh, maybe I'll major in oceanography. I was really good in science. So I, that's what I went, when I picked a school, I picked a school for oceanography. And, but when I went to there, started studying oceanography, so much math. Mm. And I'm not a math girl. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I like biology better. So I was like, well, well, what else could I do? I was kind of freaking out, you know, being a freshman and not knowing. And then I saw, you know, earth science. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. I can study the whole earth. And how, like, how does the oceans, you know, work with the whole thing? So that's, that moved me into studying environmental science. And I really have been working in the field since I graduated. Yeah. Okay. So like, so next step beyond that is this, this protecting of the environment because mm -hmm. you have a passion for it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I went right from uh, working in, you know, for right from, from college to working in corporate America. And I made that decision to work in corporate America I'd say pretty strategically, you know, I wanted to understand if these were the bad guys from what all the environmental people were saying, mm. you know, well, what could I do? How could I infiltrate the bad guys and see what they were doing? And, you know, what I realized is, you know, corporations are made of people and there are people that, you know, really do want to do good things for the environment. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we're, we're here to, you know, corporations aren't going anywhere, you know, so, but I knew people had the right heart and I wanted to see how I could help those people. And, you know, that's really why, you know, I started working, you know, I still work in corporations because I know that there is a level of protection that we can do at that, you know, in that arena. So, you know, I mean, protecting the environment, I think we all can do it. You know, I call myself an environmentalist, but I think everyone can call themselves an environmentalist. Yeah, I love that. And and so I want to clarify because you started by talking about the bad guy, right? And so I think when we talk about the bad guy, we're, you're referring to corporations as being the bad guy, meaning the the one of the key contributors to the environmental problem. Can you can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, when when I was in school, like you you either you know you you either were an environmentalist, you know, you you cared so much about the environment, you know, or you went to work for corporate America. And I said, you know, like I don't there, there's not that doesn't mean I don't love the environment as much as someone who decided to be a park ranger. Yeah. And I wanted, you know, like that was very important to me, but like, that's what happened. Like in my, in my education, even in the environmental movement, you know, the corporations were the bad guys and that's, you know, and th that, that stigma has just gone over and over and over. And, and again, like that, that stigma is not, it hasn't worked, right. Calling somebody out as a bad guy and shaming people is not working in the environmental movement. And that's really what my mission is all about now is just to change that narrative and how we talk about protecting and loving the environment. You just talked about shaming. And so I I, I think I heard environmental shaming. I'm not sure if, the, if those words came out of your mouth, but yeah. 
but like, let's talk about this. What is, what is this environmental shaming? I think that a lot of people who get into any type of activism, they're coming from a place of, you know, we, they want change and they, you know, they have, they feel the passion so much. They want change so much that, you know, it's coming from a place of what, you know, when you look at inside your body, it's coming from a place of adrenaline, right? So it's like, so when you're, when you're angry, when there's fear, you're, you just get into that shame game. You know, you just start saying what, you know, like you need to change, you need this, you need that. And, you, you know, they're, they're shitting on people a lot. Right. Yeah. And that, you know, it, I mean, I, you know, here I am an environmentalist, you know, people know me, they know my passion. And I went to a conference once I forgot my water bottle and no, you know what? It wasn't even, that's right. It wasn't even that it was my first time I flew after nine 11 and they threw, they threw my water bottle away. Like you, like it was like TSA was so crazy back yeah. then. Like there yep. was no place to, to pour your water out. You know, they threw my water bottle away. I get to the conference, you know, I need something to drink. I have a, you know, single use plastic bottle. Here are my colleagues who know me, know where my heart is. And I got shamed so bad mm. at that conference. And there people are telling me the statistics and all this kind of stuff. And I just couldn't believe it. And I, that was a big, that was a very pivotal moment for me that like, holy cow, if they're doing this to me, then they're doing this to other people and it's not going to work. Yeah. So can you, can you, expound on that a little bit more. I mean, and like how that felt for you and, and what you think is going on, like you're there at an environmental conference, right? <laughs> we talk about this very thing, right? Um, your, your heart is in the right place. So what about those people that are just kind of going about their daily lives, maybe not thinking about it as much as you are? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a, there's a perfectionism that people, again, any type, it doesn't matter if you're you're an activist for the environment, for, you know, uh, civil rights, whatever it is, I think there's the, the people that are coming from a place of anger and fear, you know, you, you go to that energy and you project that energy onto others. And that's what was happening to me at that conference. And I realized, you know, I, I had done a lot of inner work. I had done mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, work around um, happiness and success. Like, what does this mean internally for me? You know, so when I was being shamed, it, it didn't, I didn't take it personally. Um, it stung. It definitely stung. But it made me realize, okay, we have to, we have to come from a place of wanting to you know, to, to love and to, to make a change that is, is sustainable. You know, um, I call myself an imperfect advocate. I love yeah. that. An I'm not, you know, perfect advocate. Yeah. I mean, you know, I have paper towels in my house. I know that, you know, paper towels aren't that great, but you know, I try to buy the, the paper towels that are made with recycled content you know, or I'll, I'll buy the expensive bamboo ones every once in a while. Um, but I'm not getting rid of paper towels in my house because, you know, I have, I have cats and they make messes and <laughs> you know, I'm not using a reusable cloth and washing that. I'm sorry. You yeah. know? So, yeah, I mean, there's the perfectionism, like it, we can't, we know, you know, we know if you do the math, you do the statistics, we know that we need to make some big changes, you know, for our planet, but big changes come with little ones and it's okay just to make those little changes and not have to be that perfectionist. Hey everyone, it's Scott here. This podcast is a passion project for me because I absolutely love adventure. And it's thanks to the effort of my residential real estate team here in Charlotte, North Carolina, that many of you know as the W Realty Group that this podcast gets funded. This awesome group of people have unmatched levels of competence and caring for our clients. If you know of anyone looking to buy or sell a home, our team serves the Charlotte, North Carolina market, but we can also help you find an agent anywhere throughout the US or Canada through our highly connected network. 
When you support our real estate business, you are also supporting this podcast. Thanks for listening and thanks for your referrals. I love this. So, so you gave a talk recently at Oregon State University on this topic with Robert yeah. Holden. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what you guys were there to speak about? Yeah, it was really, it was really cool. Um, it, so what we did was, um, so I did a study, I took Robert had something that he called the happiness index. And this was something that he made for the Oprah Winfrey show, in fact. So the happiness index, it was about 10 questions had a one through five rating of not true to very true. So it was questions like, you know, um, I make time for self care. I, um, you know, I, I sleep regularly, things like that. So what I decided was, well, I, I was curious. I think a lot of these things come, you know, from just having being open to curiosity. Yeah. Right. And so I was curious, well, what if, what if the, what if I, peppered in some questions about environmental action and would people that said you know very true to true like so i had questions on if like this is one one of them was if i if i see a plastic bottle when i'm on a hike i would pick it up and recycle it when i got home and what i did was i looked at the people that scored that question true and very true. And I looked at what is their happiness index. So for that question, 82% scored that set of four. So it was, it was, um, it was very true. I mean, no, I'm sorry, just true. Okay. 82% either had a healthy or very healthy score on the happiness index. 97% had a healthy to very healthy score that said very true, that they would pick up that, that bottle and recycle it. And then the other thing I did was I took the data. And so that was my, my quantitative yeah. part of this I'm study. This. Yeah. So then I did a qualitative. So the qualitative is all about like, you know, interviewing and you, you know, you're having more of a discussion with people. So I took people who filled out the survey and I asked, hey, if you're if you own an electric car or you own a hybrid car, I want to have an interview with you. Okay. So the people that said yes, we talked to them and I said, I asked them, why did you buy that electric car or hybrid car? I asked them if they did they do it because they love the technology, they love to save money, or did they love the environment? A hundred percent of the people that said that they loved the planet. That's why they bought their car, their EV or hybrid car, 100% had a healthy or very healthy score on the happiness index. Nice. So what this data showed me was like, okay, so happy people, these are the people that are doing the work. These are people that are gonna save the planet. When I started thinking about it, I started thinking about all the people that I've worked with. And I also looked at when environmental regulations, you know, came to be. And like I mentioned before, Earth Day happened in 1970, right? Yep. What was happening before Earth Day? The whole hippie movement, flower power, you know, make love, not war, yeah. all those good things, right? The first, all the environmental regulations that are, that are the big ones in this country, the EPA was founded in 1970, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, all these things. And the hippie movement was not saying, shame on you. They were bringing some, some, some hard things to the table. You know, they weren't saying that, hey, you know, th they were saying, look, we have some problems. And like even Jacques Cousteau, who I mentioned before, you know, Jacques Cousteau, he was working for oil and gas. He was not like this naturalist who just made, you know, these beautiful um, specials on PBS. He was working for oil and gas. He saw what was happening to the ocean. And he said, you know, I got to do something about this. So he figured out he was an inventor and he figured out, OK, how do I bring cameras down to the ocean? 
and show people how beautiful it is down here. Because he said, and this quote like still sticks with me, I think I, I think about it every day. He said, you, you protect what you love. Mm, yeah. So, so people like, so, so the people that to me were making big moves in the environmental movement were not coming from that place of shaming. They were coming from the place of love. They were showing people, you know, this is, you know, we need to do this because it's the right thing to do. I'm yeah. loving this so much. And, you know, I'm thinking right now, I mean, so first of all, you said hippies had it right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, there was no, sh there was no shaming in the way that hippies brought this all about. And I just imagine like these people dancing around saying free love, man, you know, it's all about love. Right. But this is, but there's truth to what, what we're, what we're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah. Ha happy people love the planet and people yeah. that love that planet are happy. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's super interesting. Um, uh, back in September, I went with a group to the kingdom of Bhutan um, and we visited the gross national happiness center there. Mm -hmm. um, where they, they similar kind of stuff where they're, they were studying happiness. Um, Bhutan is extremely ecologically and environmentally friendly. They're the only carbon uh, neutral, uh, actually carbon negative uh, country in the world. And um, there's a huge piece to that that ties back to the happiness of the people there. So, you sure. know, there's, there's something to this. Yeah. Sure. No, I mean, I really, I really feel that, you know, when you, I mean, just think about when you've had a conversation with someone and you tried to, to, to shame them into change, you know, if someone's like not eating well. And you say, you know, like, like, oh, like, that's disgusting. What are you doing? Da, da, da. You know, that's not going to help them make make that change. Yeah. And that's what really we've what you know what we've been doing in the environmental movement is so much of this the shame game. And I'm really you know just to be honest, I'm I'm sick of it. <laughs> I'm tired of it. And it's just you know when when I have conversations that are coming from a place of this is the right thing to do. You know, I'm doing this because it feels good. You know, that's when we get things done. That's when change happens. You know, even within a corporation, you know, I, I call these people my sustainable souls because they, you know, they are, they're coming from that place of let's do, let's do the right thing. Yeah. So, so what is the path? What is the path forward? You you do, I alluded in the intro, like you have this approach that cuts through the politics and it unites rather than divides. Like talk, talk to us about that path forward. You know, I, I just really want the conversations that people are having, even if it's, you know, between, you know, just talking to your neighbor or talking about, you know, it's just coming from a place of love. And really what I talk about is that love is a renewable energy. It's probably, it's the renewable energy and we don't talk enough about it. We don't talk about, you know, how really love can save this planet. You know, when you think about like, what is a renewable energy, right? It's something that it's a source that cannot be depleted and you can always you know, you can always generate love. Mm. So when you're, you know, like, for example, like I have a compost, you know, a, a compost uh, bin yep. that my husband made for me. It was probably the best present I ever got. And it's made out of, you know, old pallets. I love it. And I don't, you know, I don't tell people like, oh, everyone should have a compost, you know, pile like I do. I, you know, I show them, look how cool this thing is. <laughs> you could have this in your backyard for free. Find, you need, how many, one, two, three, you need four pallets and boom, you're done. You know, like you try it. It's And, and I think like, you know, I want to talk from a place of, of love and enthusiasm that gets people to say, okay, you know, I, I could try that. Yeah, it, it's it's fun when you can buy them too. We have one in our yard, yeah. and it's always fun to go out there and take the banana peels and the eggshells and all that, and open it up and and see what's growing in there. You know, there's all kinds of all kinds of fun critters and stuff working their magic in there. But yeah, um, 
Yeah. And it does. It, it, and I can, I can see it in you. It, 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 it just uh, sparks your curiosity. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like I love, like I, I do a lot of talks on green products because I just love, there's so many good solutions out there. It just, you know, we need to talk about it. We need to share, you know, so I just saw, I just said, you know, green products that I love and, you know, encourage other people to try them as well. Yeah. So Karen, I, I want to talk about specifically love as a solution to the environment and, yeah. and, and practically speaking, like what, what does that mean? Yeah. So for me, I truly believe, and, and from, you know, from our study, it, when we are coming from, when we've done our inner work, you know, we, you know, there's a lot of like, like Buddhists talk about this, um, a lot of different practices talk about how, when you, you know, you, you do the inner work to get the outer results. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, it, I truly believe that that can go all the way out to the environment. Um, Confucius talked about something he called the concentric circles. And Confucius was really big into like, how do you create a, you know, the ultimate society is really what, you know, he, he was, he was trying to figure out as a philosopher. But what he talked about with these concentric circles is that you start in the middle, it's you. And you have to be you know, like basically clean yourself up first. So you clean, you know, you clean your thoughts, you clean, you know, you do, you do the inner work. And then you go out and you, and how does that influence your family? How does that influence then your community? And then you start, you know, building out these concentric circles. And I truly believe that, you know, that can affect the whole planet. And I always, you know, with so many things with the environment too, is it, it's, you know, we make decisions that maybe aren't pro environmental when we're busy, you know, fast food, um, you know, plastic water bottles, you know, you, you make those quick decisions and that throwaway economy that we have it just, it's there. I want to chime in on this a little bit because I actually, we, I think you and I had a conversation about this, but, um, you know, I walk my daughter to school every morning and, and recently we're, and we've got the dog with us. So we have our little baggies and, you know, we're putting his stuff in the little baggies, but sometimes we make space. If I see a water bottle or something, I'll pick it up. And, um, I just kind of had this realization and probably stating the obvious, but I noticed that whenever I'm picking up trash, it's more often than not junk food yeah, or beer cans or cigarette butts or these things that are bad for us that we all like collectively know and understand to be bad for us. Like you don't usually see like health food, like you're not, you're not typically picking up like an empty bag of carrots that that's been littered, right? Like right. things that are good for us, people don't typically litter with that kind of stuff. Right. And yeah. I just wonder if there's a connection there because I heard you say like, clean yourself up first. Yeah. And then, you know, and then the concentric circles grow from there, but I'm just curious, like your, your thoughts on that. And, and what, what do you think's going on there? I mean, it's, it's a lot of our culture, I think has a lot to do with it. So if you're, you know, fast food is it's part of the, the you know, the throwaway culture. So what do you do with this? You know, okay, I just threw away nutrition for the day, you know, by, by eating this stuff. So what do I do with all this, you know, the wrappers and things? Okay. You know, you just throw it away. You just throw it wherever you, you know, who cares? And I think when you, if you, if you're making some decisions, you know, smoking is a good one, you know, I don't care, you know, yeah, I know it's not good for me. I don't care. So like, so even if like that subconscious to me, that subconscious programming is going on in you. So you don't care. So if you don't care about yourself, you're not going to care about the planet. You're just going to throw that cigarette butt. So I love that you're talking about it being subconscious because I, I agree. I, I, I give people the benefit of the doubt. Yes. Um, but I don't, and I don't think that people are necessarily like throwing their cigarette butt in the street and, and consciously saying like, 
I'm going to litter today because I just right. want to do that. Like they're, they are doing it subconsciously. Yeah. Um, but it does reflect like a lack of caring about themselves. Yeah. Um, and I guess, you know, I think sometimes we feel like we're preaching to the choir because, you know, it, those, those people that are eating healthy foods and doing healthy things for themselves are not taking the wrappers from that stuff and throwing it out into the street. Right. And so I think the question really is like those, those people that are taking good care of themselves that are practicing like healthy eating and just, you know, self-love and self-care, right. How do we then impact a greater group? Like, how do we get to those people that are doing things that aren't healthy for them and then contributing to, you know, the the unhealthiness of the environment? I, you know, they talk a lot about, you know, uh, show, don't tell, right? When you're telling a story, you know, if you're, if you're facilitating, if, you know, within, you know, uh, when we're doing presentations in corporate or training people, right? You want to show them. You don't want to just tell them. So anytime you can bring somebody on a journey with you, you know, that's an opportunity. You know, you're you're doing a journey, you know, to the Grand Canyon. You know, when when it's Earth Day, you're going to be in the Grand Canyon at the bottom. I mean, how amazing is that? So you're bringing people on this journey. And, you know, that's really the way people and that's how we are. We learn we learn through experience, we learn through stories. So it's, that's how we can, you know, we can do this in a very non preachy way. Yeah. And I, I guess what I'm hearing you say is, you know, we talked about like shaming doesn't work. So telling people it's not going to, it's not going to help, but, but role modeling, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, letting people see you pick up trash, letting people see you practice environmentally conscious uh, behaviors and showing them that it's okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, look at social media, right? Like the, you know, the influencers on social media, you know, why, if, if, um, you know, if Kim Kardashian says, go buy something, you know, millions of young girls go out and buy it. So, so you, so we need to do that, you know, at that level, you can be any, anyone can be an influencer for the environment, especially when you connect to what you love, because what you, when, when you, like, if I took you outside and we found some ants and you mean, me and you sat down and we looked at some ants together, you know, um, I know I would get you excited about ants. You know? <laughs> I know you would, <laughs> but that's, you know, and that's the, that's the energy that, I believe is going to make change and that's going to make, you know, people want to, you know, figure out well, what do I love about the environment? What do, what do I love, you know, that I want to share with someone? Cause like, well, you know, who doesn't want to share what they love and we can do that for the environment. You know, if you find a uh, you know, you find something that's a green product that you love, you know, to, you, I got this coolest thing that I found. Like I do that with people all the time. Look at this cool thing I found. And, you know, and share that with people. But even just sharing, I just truly believe just coming from a place of love, you know, just putting any type of love, it could be poetry, it could be, you know, a song, it could be a podcast. You know, this is this type of stuff that's helping, it's going to help the planet. Yeah, I think so. I love this so much. And, you know, I think that the thing about this podcast is we're trying to encourage people to listen to the voice inside that calls them to adventure and to help people get outside and go yeah. do the things that they really want to do. And I, and I would say that the more time you spend outside, the more like you're naturally going to just become a, an environmentalist, because the more that you are spending time outside, the more you develop that appreciation and the gratitude and you, and you see the impacts and the effects that it has on our ability to adventure, you yeah. know, when, when the environment gets, um, gets damaged. Yeah. And so Karen, with that, I want to know, like, what, what does adventure look like for you these days? Well, adventure for me has been all about speaking, you know, and getting this message out into the world. Um, it's about, you know, me finding 
you know, finding different avenues even to talk about this. So I so appreciate having this adventure with being on a podcast. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love, probably one of my favorite things is um, I have a, you know, I have my passport for the national parks. So I'm always trying to uh, get all my stamps and my passport. Um, so that's always an adventure for me um, as well. Yeah. So, and I, you know, I, I, I've been to your home and I know that you live, you know, you've got a big expansive piece of property with a lot of nature and um, you get to live that on a daily basis, really. Yeah. Yeah. We have at least, I'd say oh, 15 deer that come through the yard every day. Um, we have raccoons and possums and we haven't had a lot of wild turkey, but we've had some in the past. Um we used to have a pheasant um, that my mom used to feed and she would shake the can with some bird seed and the pheasant would come running down the hill. Uh, it was just, it was so much fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, I try to every day, what I realized that was, you know, sometimes when I go outside, I go outside to get someplace, you know, so I'm, you know, I'm going from my house to my yeah. car, to work, to the store, you know, whatever it is. And I just said, you know what, I have to take a deep breath outside every day, have to. And that just kind of that's been a part of like my adventure and daily practice with with doing that inner work. And just gosh, when you take a good intentional breath of air and it's it feels clean and it feels, you know, just it feels good you know, that makes me want to, you know, protect the environment too. It does because you want to, you want to maintain that, right? We don't want to lose that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Karen, as an environmentalist and Earth Day coming up and, and as this podcast releases, it will, you know, Earth Day will be upon us. Yeah. What are you specifically doing for Earth Day? I am doing a few talks on um, green products because these are things that I love. So I want to share that with people. You know, a lot of times, like some green products came out early and some weren't that great. I, you know, like I, for example, like there's laundry detergent that is a little, is more sustainable. It's better for the environment. You know, it breaks down, um, breaks down better. It doesn't um, have microplastics in it. You know, it's the packaging's better, all these kind of things. When some of the first green laundry detergents came out, I, of course, I jumped on the bandwagon right away, but they took out a lot of the fragrance. Now, fragrance is a chemical. I know that as a scientist, but guess what? Like I said, I'm an imperfect advocate. I like my, my clothes to smell good. You know, I wanted to smell like, you know, they've been washed. So I was like, okay, this stuff isn't good. But now there's some great products out there that you still get that great smell, a uh, little less chemically. So like those are the types of things that I want to share with people to, to help people make the change and, you know, and find things that they love so that it gets whole. Like, so here I am just sharing cool things. I'm not telling people to, you know, you got to make these changes, but I'm just encouraging you know, let's try to make some of these changes. So I'm really, I'm really excited to, to get out there and, you know, just to share, share green products that I love. So that's what, that's my concentration this Earth Day. Yeah. Can you, uh, can you, can you give us a couple of your favorite green products? Yeah. Um, I love, um, there's a, there's something called a moisture stone by Kate McLeod. Uh, and we'll, I'll make sure you get all the links for the show notes. Awesome. But instead of it, you know, instead of like moisturizer coming in a plastic bottle with the pump and all that, it's a stone and you rub it in your hands and it just, the moisturizer, you know, it's like a, it's cocoa butter and it just, you know, gives you moisture, you know, gives you the, the solution to rub on your body, but it comes in a, a little burlap piece of cloth and a you know a paper box so there's nothing left after you use this product you can recycle the the cardboard you can even compost you know the the material that it's wrapped in 
So it's amazing. That's, that's one of my favorites. Um, my other favorite is for wrapping paper. Uh, there's a company called Global Wrap Share. And um, I have a feeling we might be hearing some more about that on the podcast. We soon. might hear, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all like it's it's a sustainable wrapping paper company where the coolest thing about it, I think, is the coolest thing, besides it being reusable, is inside you get a piece of cloth, they're and they're beautiful pieces of cloth. They're from all around the world. Inside there's a um, almost like an old school library card. So you put in there, you know, the date, who the gift went to, and that you were the gifter. And then you can see all the times that it's been reused oh, and you gifted. Cool. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. So things like that, I just love, you know, and like that, you know, we you can just talk about the coolness of that product without even talking about the environmental benefit. Yeah, I love that. And so Karen, I want to know your approach. Like sometimes there are, um, products that people might find, um, I don't know if controversial is the right word, but from a standpoint of like environmentalism, like maybe they're packaged in, in such a way where it's like, you know, appears to be environmentally friendly, but you have the skeptics that think it's just marketing, right? Like how do you deal with that controversy around, you know, is a product really good for the environment or not? Like, yeah, I mean, there, there's a whole a whole group, you know, many, many nonprofits, uh, non-government agencies, NGOs, they call them, um, that are looking at that, that particular thing, which is called greenwashing. So greenwashing is a company will make claims and they really, you know, the claims really aren't anything. It happens all the time. And, you know, what I would say is like, find, you know, there, there are some groups that are out there that are just doing it for good consumer information and not from a political standpoint, you know, so um, their agenda isn't to blame and shame. Their agenda just is saying, hey, we, you know, we're going to call out some, we're going to call out things that aren't really green. And, you know, those organizations, um, some of them, you know, there's even local organizations that people can look for that will help you, you know, if you're not in the weeds like I am, you know, to make some of those decisions for yourself and and, and feel good that you're making the, a good a good decision, a good you're 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 promoting and putting your money behind a good product. Yeah. And and I got to believe that, you know, we're we're all human. We're, you know, we're we're capable of errors and mistakes, sure. right? There's going to mm -hmm. be products that we're going to latch onto that we think are good for the environment and then find out later that it's like what like is there any is there a shaming like around that, that we can, that we can kind of move past. You know, the, I just think when we, you know, I hope this is what I, I hope that when you know better, you do better. That's it. And I, and I believe that people want to come from that place. So there could be some mistakes that companies have made. You know, we thought there was, um, you know, many, many types of chemicals. I mean, just how we used to treat um, a lot of chemicals, like, so like back in the seventies and the eighties, you know, flammable materials. So things that, you know, can catch on fire, right? But what happens, you put them, you know, you, you expose them to air and they just evaporate. So back in the day, there used to be all these lagoons for these types of chemicals. And they used to think, oh, good, it just, it went away. <laughs> and that's when we had the hole in the ozone layer. Yeah. Because we just said, oh, it went away. Yeah. But guess what? We know better, so we do better. And the hole in the ozone layer is pretty much fixed. Now, we don't talk about that. You talk about eagles. I got to talk, well, tell you once, eagles, right? DDT. We knew, we knew that that, that chemical that it was a pesticide right that chemical was killing eagles so their the, the their egg shells could not harden because the mama eagle had ddt in her system so she the poor thing would sit on her eggs and they would just you know they would collapse we knew that and we fixed that and now eagles, like, I mean, 
I saw an eagle in New Jersey yeah. a few years ago and I just was like, I just, I, I stopped. I'm, I really almost got in an accident. <laughs> <laughs> They're beautiful. We have them here in Charlotte too. Yeah. 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 But we, we, you know, and that was, that was a, a huge, huge example of we knew better. So we did better. Yeah. You were, you were full of nuggets today. I'm going to just recap a couple of my favorites from today. I don't usually summarize, but <laughs> that, that one's great. When you know better, you do better. Yeah. That was a great one. And then I heard you say, clean yourself up first. And of course, love is a renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And we got that one from the hippies, right? The hippies had it right. <laughs> I love that so much. So Karen, um, what is your recommendation for the best ways that people can get involved to help protect the earth, not just on Earth Day, but but always? Yeah. Well, you know, like I said earlier, you know, the people that are listening to this, this podcast, you know, you 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 go outside, you know, you camp, you know, take somebody with you, take them, you know, just even demonstrating you know, packing in and packing out, you know, leaving nothing behind, you know, that is a mindset that you can bring to your, your, your day, you know, but experiencing that camping, I think that would make a big impact. So find somebody, find somebody that's never gone camping and take them with you, take them on a hike. If that's too scary for them, you know, show them your favorite tree, Show them, you know, your, you know, the, your favorite river, your favorite ocean, you know, show them pictures of your, the last adventure that you just went on. Cause that's going to inspire them to do that. This is what inspire campfire is all about. You know, we're inspiring people to, to take that. And so like, I, it just, in, it's important for the planet to bring people along on the journey. And, and, you know, and that's, I think that's something we really can, we can do, we can all do, you know, and especially our young ones, you know, find a kid that's never gone on a hike and just, you know, take them out there and show them what it's all about. Oh, I love it. Karen, you, I, I'm so thankful for people like you that care so much that are, that are doing the work to collect the data and to be able to, to give the talks, to share with people. Um, the facts, right? And to be so real about it. So there's no need to shame. That's what no. I heard today. There is no, no need to shame. It doesn't work. And uh, so Karen, at some point with all of that you've done for the protection of this planet, Hollywood is going to find out about your story and they're going to want to make a movie about your life. <laughs> and when they do, I want to know who the Hollywood actress is going to be that's going to play you in your movie. I, you may not know this about me, Scott, but I starred in, when well, I didn't star, but I was, I, I was in the International Thespian Society in high school. Nice. So I would say that perhaps I should play myself. Okay. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but if I had to pick somebody, if I had to pick like someone who is an, is a, you know, a paid actress or a paid performer, I'm going to select um ben de la creme ben de la creme yeah so ben de la creme is a uh is a, a drag queen and i just feel like that is my my persona would be probably best displayed by a drag queen i love it okay <laughs> i got it We're, uh, this, it's on now so i want to know what the movie's going to be called i think it should be called the imperfect advocate Ooh. yeah the imperfect advocate starring karen ald or maybe Ben de la Creme. Yeah. <laughs> maybe we'll, we'll split it up, you know. Okay. Ben could do like the first part of my life and I'll, I'll do the, you know. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, it worked in The Crown. They split the they split the actresses, the actors and actresses up in that movie. So it can work yeah. for your movie too. Okay, I, good. <laughs> I, I love this. So Karen, if people want to find out more, they want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? jump on my website. It's just karenald.com and you'll find all my socials and all the links and all that fun stuff there. Great. And we'll make sure to include all of that in the show notes as well. Um, Karen, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. This has been super fun as conversations with you always are. And for those listening, I hope you've been inspired today as much as I have. 
I hope that Karen's story has encouraged you to listen to the voice inside that calls you to adventure because we want to hear your story next. If you have a story to tell or you need a nudge to create one, please send me an email. We'd also appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word by leaving a review and sharing or tagging Inspire Campfire in your social media. And until next time, I want to encourage you to get outside. Thanks for listening. Karen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Scott.